Greetings everyone. I am Alizia Jaffrey and I welcome you to another episode of the CIS Faculty Conversation Series. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Ankit Panda, a US scholar working on areas of arms control, non-proliferation, nuclear strategy, and all things related to missile technology. He's currently a Stanton Senior Fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's also editor at large of the, of the Diplomat magazine, which he practically helped establish in 2013. Uh, he has written for various places like the Washington Post, New York Times, Foreign Policy, The Diplomat, War on the Rocks, um, and the Washington Quarterly. Ankit has been associated with various organizations like the Federation of, of American Scientists, the IISS, and other reputed organizations, and he has advised the UN on matters related to non-proliferation, disarmament, and arms control. Um, Ankit has recently authored a book entitled Kim Jong-un and the Bomb, Survival and Deterrence in North Korea. And ironically, and interestingly, the book came out exactly three years after Trump made that fire and fury remark um, on the 7th of August 2017, if I'm not wrong. Yes, so uh, we will discuss with Ankit his new book. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have a quick summary of the book from the author himself, and then we'll engage in a Q&A session. So thank you very much, Ankit, for uh, joining us in this uh, faculty conversation series. I would start off by asking you an opening question. You have developed an inexorable connection between the survival of Kim Jong-un, nuclear weapons and deterrence. So you've brought deterrence theory in the mix right up front. And this is in sharp contrast to what Rux Tillerson said in 2017 in an article co-authored with James Mattis that strategic accountability has to be done uh, of North Korea and that rational deterrence theory does not apply to the very country. So I want you to explain this, the thesis of your book and then explain to our audience as to why you chose this path and route. Thank you very much, over to you. Sure, great. So yeah, thank you so much for having me today. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Um, so just very briefly about the thesis of the book and really the reason uh, I decided to write the book in the first place. Um, so uh, obviously 2017 was a pivotal year in many ways for North Korea. They crossed several important technical milestones, uh, not least of which was their uh, ability to first uh, to flight test their first ever intercontinental range ballistic missile design, bringing the U.S. homeland into range, holding holding the U.S. homeland at risk, which is something they'd never done before. In fact, um, it was the first time in 46 years that a nuclear armed adversary of the United States had tested an ICBM. Of course, what happened 46 years before 2017, that was when China tested the DF-5 for the first time, um, becoming the second nuclear armed adversary of the United States after the Soviet Union to have that capability. Uh, but of course, policy in the United States has, I think, dragged behind uh, some of these realities. Uh, so as you, as you just hinted at, uh, Rex Tillerson, other, uh, other officials, the discourse around North Korea in 2017 um, was in a place where we were not only doubting Kim Jong-un's rationality, whether this leader could be trusted to possess nuclear weapons, but uh, there were also other parts of this conversation, including um, you know, doubting North Korea's technical proficiency with these technologies, uh, implying that they're uh, even if they tested a couple ICBMs that, you know, we don't need to design policy with the assumption that their reentry vehicles could survive and hit the United States. Um, so the book is really a corrective to a lot of that. Uh, so it it, it, it it tries to provide a unified theory of how North Korea reasons about nuclear weapons in its national defense strategy. Uh, and as you hinted at it, uh, it is about preventing uh, existential threats uh, to the regime and more specifically to the persona of Kim Jong-un himself because North Korea's political system being what it is, um, it is effectively a monolithic uh, Marxist-Leninist monarchy. It is a, it is a very unique system uh, anywhere in the world, especially among nuclear armed states. Uh, even if you compare it to um, a, a country like China, we see very different considerations uh, in, in North Korea. Um, and then the book, um, uh, you know, the book is divided into three parts. The first part uh, orients the reader with uh, the North Korean political system, um, Kim Jong-un as a leader, uh, North Korean nuclear strategy, and the history of uh, attempts to um, 
disarm North Korea, uh, really the history of North Korea as a non-proliferation problem. Um, and I hope my book is sort of a one of the touchstones that I think um, that indicates that North Korea has now moved away from being a non-proliferation problem to being a broader disarmament problem, uh, that they are a nuclear armed state today, uh, and that they will probably retain these weapons for years to come, uh, decades to come, that, that denuclearization disarmament is not a short-term objective. Um, and then the second part of the book uh, talks about the, uh, the hardware. Uh, this is the part of the book that's probably the least accessible for most readers, uh, but I hope it, 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 it nevertheless retains value. Um, basically uh, tracking the story of how North Korea became a missile power and how they um, built the bomb uh, and uh, everything we know about those processes. And finally, the book concludes with uh, prescriptive thoughts on treating North Korea as a disarmament problem, the role of potential arms control with North Korea, uh, I also scrutinized the uh, 2018 and 2019 uh, diplomacy between the United States and North Korea and South Korea and North Korea, and I'll lay out a few suggestions for how we might treat this issue going forward. Uh, now, to answer your second question about uh, Rex Tillerson, uh, I actually believe that that, that statement might have come from um, H.R. McMaster, uh, the National Security Advisor at the time. But uh, either way, uh, there was a lot of doubting that Kim Jong-un couldn't be trusted with nuclear weapons. Uh, and, you know, different people had different um, views on this. Uh, some people would cite North Korea's human rights record as saying that a country that uh, operates uh, prison camps for its uh, for its population uh, is just uniquely cruel and cannot be trusted to possess these weapons. Uh, but of course, you know, many similar arguments were being made uh, in the late 60s after China's nuclear tests, um, implying that Mao could not be trusted with nuclear weapons for similar reasons. Um, and of course, the um, whatever, whatever you might think about the North Korean regime uh, and its internal practices, uh, that tells us very little about the purported rationality with which they viewed the role of nuclear weapons. And the case that I really make in the book, uh, and this isn't really a, a new approach. I mean, uh, scholars working on North Korea have uh, used this framing for a while to talk about how the state reasons about international affairs more generally, which is that the North Koreans, uh, uh, more so than perhaps uh, any other nuclear armed uh, any other nuclear armed state, uh, do reason like the prototypical uh, neo-realist state thinkers. I mean, they see an anarchic international system where a small country um, can either, you know, balance externally to um, seek um, seek its own security, but ultimately at the end of the day, uh, it does respond to a logic of self-help. And here's where the North Koreans see the reason to have their own nuclear weapons and not rely on uh, assurances from China, for instance, uh, you know, North Korea and China have a 1961 mutual defense treaty. It's actually China's only treaty of that kind. Uh, but of course, that, um, those, uh, those assurances just aren't good enough for a state like North Korea that would rather take matters into its own hands, ensuring that uh, its destiny is not tied to uh, any of its great power patrons, uh, and that it's, a, uh, that it's able to assure its own survival uh, in what it sees as a, a unique, um, as a uniquely hostile uh, international system. Okay, thank you very much for giving this uh, succinct overview. Uh, let me pose you another question. Uh, you have, throughout the book, you've talked about how Kim was bent upon completing, quote unquote, deterrence. And by completing deterrence, you meant, and he meant, that the DPRK wanted to have the ability to target US cities and you know make hostage american cities and american population to of uh, for a counter value strike so that things could not not blow back on its own territory so what is it that now you know brings us to a very important question is that why uh, since things are complete as far as kim is concerned what is now US looking to do? What options that does it have? You talked about the fact that uh, we need to think about arms control with North Korea as compared to disarmament probably, because disarmament, you right, rightly say upfront, is not uh, likely uh, to be achieved because Kim would not give up his uh, jewel, the sword. So this leaves us with a very, very important question. What practical options does the United States have to counter the North Korean nuclear threat? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. It's a it's an area uh, 
of a lot of work and thinking right now, uh, basically redesigning uh, North Korea policy after 30 years of failure to prevent uh, what happened in 2017, uh, right? The, the qualitative benchmarks that North Korea crossed that year, um, I think were, were incredibly significant. Uh, and since then, we've seen quantitative growth, both in terms of their fissile material stockpiles, uh, their physical um, number of missiles and potentially even launchers. Uh, so that's all very concerning. It, it sets North Korea up as a fairly capable nuclear weapons state. I mean, this is no longer a rudimentary deterrent uh, like it was under, under Kim Jong-il. Uh, North Korea conducted its first nuclear test in 2006, of course. Um, but between 2006 and 2017, uh, nobody really considered North Korea to be a, a, a nuclear power uh, in the way that uh, we've come to think about it since then. Um, so the arms control approach, um, you know, I mean, arms control is a polarizing framing for this because when you when you tell people you want to do arms control with North Korea, um, you know, for some people, arms control is very much seen as something that superpowers do between each other, um, you know, um, and specifically the Soviet Union uh, and uh, eventually Russia and the United States. Um, there you had a relationship of parity and capabilities. Uh, you saw... Um, you know, both sides had a, a, a triad that was um, that in the heyday of the Cold War ballooned to ridiculous sizes. And so arms control became a way to manage both the costs of competition uh, and the consequences of deterrence failure. Uh, with North Korea, uh, of course, we have massive asymmetry, uh, right? So North Korea has a handful of nuclear weapons. The United States has uh, more than 1,500 deployed warheads. Um, so how do you meaningfully talk about arms control? So a term that I've started to favor uh, more uh, in terms of communicating with folks for whom arms control means something very, very specific uh, is, is, is risk reduction, uh, right? Because uh, ultimately we do find ourselves in, uh, and you know, here I'm speaking as an American, uh, we do find ourselves in a nuclear deterrence relationship with North Korea, uh, which means that the risk of nuclear use uh, if deterrence were to fail is real. And so ultimately, we have to think seriously about managing uh, those risks in, in peacetime uh, and, and ensuring that if a crisis is to arise on the Korean Peninsula, that the tendency of crises, of future crises, is to revert to the status quo ante and not escalate further uh, to the point where nuclear weapons might be used. Um, and as I point out in the book, uh, there's a particular urgency to this because North Korea has a very offensively oriented nuclear strategy. Um, and uh, as, uh, as I think is well apparent, especially to uh, followers of nuclear issues in South Asia, uh, one, of the, one of the problems for new nuclear weapon states uh, is always uh, assuring the robustness of one's command and control. Uh, it doesn't matter how well your missiles fly, it doesn't matter how high your uh, yields are in underground nuclear tests, but at the end of the day, uh, you need to have some degree of assurance that your nuclear weapons will be available when necessary. Uh, to maintain the credibility of your deterrent. So these are the issues that North Korea, I think, uh, still has to uh, finesse. Um, and it's, of course, uh, no, uh, no straightforward challenge. Uh, the North Koreans uh, have, uh, are exercising assertive command and control right now, but of course, um, crisis dynamics could change that. Uh, Kim could decide to, uh, uh, to delegate use authority. And, and you know, these are the things that we don't actually understand very well uh, because we don't talk to the North Koreans about, about these issues. Uh, so that's, again, another issue is uh, beginning to understand each other's um, um, nuclear use thresholds, doctrines. There's obviously a great deal of mistrust. The North Koreans view uh, American nuclear declaratory policy with a great degree of mistrust. In fact, they, you know, believe that American tactical nuclear weapons that left the Korean Peninsula in 1991 uh, never actually left. Uh, so there's just all of this um, um, mistrust under undergirding this relationship that I think does amplify our risks in a crisis. So that's really the first place to start. And then eventually, perhaps we do get to more traditional arms control arrangements where um, after having established a baseline of trust with the North Koreans, we're able to talk about certain things like capping their uh, deployment numbers, the sites at which they deploy missiles, uh, perhaps monitoring that their uh, strategic missiles are being kept at specific operating bases uh, in peacetime to uh, manage and reduce risks. Um, but all of this, of course, is um, very far from being right around the corner. This will take sustained efforts uh, and really, frankly, a fundamental rethinking of, of the North Korea issue. Uh, since you talked about uh, NC2, and you gave a very interesting concept in your book, while navigating Peter Fever's Never Always Dilemma, you talked about a devolution of command and control. Would you like to delve into that further for our audience? What, what do you mean by, the, by a devolved command and control system? 
and where does it lie on the never always equation that all nuclear weapon states have to contend with? Sure. So uh, devolution and pre-delegation are, are somewhat related concepts, but different. Uh, so b both concepts basically address the issue of, um, uh, so, you know, I should begin by saying that North Korea, uh, while they haven't released a nuclear doctrine, uh, they have released several documents um, hinting at things that would be traditionally included in a document that we might call a nuclear doctrine. But one of the things they've told us very unambiguously is that the only source of a valid order for the use of nuclear weapons in the country is the supreme leader of the KPA, um, being Kim Jong Un. Uh, he is the only person uh, that has that authority. Uh, so in that ways, you know, it's a it's a similar system to that one that we have here in the United States. Um, pre delegation would mean that in a crisis, uh, if Kim is concerned about potentially being taken out in a decapitation strike, for instance. Um, you know, we have we have two outcomes there. If if Kim is successfully decapitated early in a conflict by, let's say, a conventional precision South Korean or American missile, uh, he is no longer alive to issue valid orders for the use of nuclear weapons. Therefore, North Korea's nuclear deterrent no longer really exists because if those orders can't be issued, nuclear weapons can't be used. Um, so one of the ways for him to prevent that and reduce incentives for North, uh, for the United States and South Korea to actually attempt a decapitation strike is to indicate that. Um, nuclear use authority would be delegated in a crisis. Uh, so that would mean that Kim would tell the director of the KPA, uh, the commander of the KPA strategic rocket forces that he now has authority and he can further devolve that authority to, um, to field commanders to use nuclear weapons uh, as they see fit to, um, to uh, uh, repel attacks on North Korea. Uh, so under such a circumstance, uh, presumably we would be deterred from attempting a decapitation strike on Kim Jong-un because we do not want nuclear use authority to um, be pre-delegated. Uh, of course, this is not something, uh, the pre-delegation discussion, uh, I should also clarify, uh, is not something that North Korea has told us. It is, it is something that um, you know, I, I've interrogated in the book uh, in terms of how North Korea might evolve its posture to deal with future crises. The devolution issue is related. The devolution issue assume, uh, answers a question that was actually somewhat relevant earlier this year, if you might recall, there were uh, rumors flying around the world of Kim Jong-un uh, being very ill or potentially having died. Uh, so then the question becomes, uh, what happens in that outcome where, where Kim Jong-un is incapacitated or has died for unrelated reasons? How does nuclear use authority devolve in the North Korean political system? Uh, in the United States, we have procedures for this uh, with, with uh, authority um, passing down the, um, the uh, order of succession. Uh, to the vice president, speaker of the house, and and so forth. Um, but in North Korea, there's no clarity. So uh, you know, some folks have speculated that it might go to his uh, sister, his very trusted sister, who carries the blood of Kim Il Sung uh, and is part of the so-called Pektusan bloodline, which is North Korea's uh, ruling a ruling family. Um, or it may go to a um, a senior military officer, a a high level uh, Workers Party of Korea. Um, cadre or some kind of collective body. So these questions remain unanswered, but the uh, but the answers I think do matter quite a bit. Of course, in a in a centralized uh, dictatorship like North Korea, uh, devolving or indicating how authority might devolve might undermine your own leadership. So Kim Jong Un, I think, has to be careful about indicating both internally and externally that there would be potential other um, people within the country who could control his weapons. Um, you know, there are also some other unanswered questions. I mean, Kim Jong-un, uh, starting in 2018, began traveling outside of the country. And we don't really know uh, how, um, how um, nuclear use authority might have been devolved or, or delegated while he was in Singapore to meet the U.S. president or in, um, in Beijing to meet uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, so these questions uh, do, I think, merit importance in terms of thinking about uh, a North Korean uh, nuclear command and control. Thank you very much. Uh, you have uh, extensively worked on extended deterrence as far as USA is concerned. And we have this uh, realization that uh, with North Korea getting a bomb of, of its own, it even if it was not in a position to target the US, it was in a position to hold Tokyo or Seoul hostage. And effectively, it could have decoupled the alliance between, uh, let's say, USA and Japan. Now, with North Korea completing its deterrent uh, and having received the ability and the propensity to target U.S. homeland, in such a scenario, where do you see uh, U.S. extended deterrence in the Korean Peninsula and elsewhere headed? And what is the future of extended deterrence uh, of the U.S. 
in that area and also elsewhere uh, with one of the adversaries uh, mm -hmm. going nuclear and you know uh, sitting right next to two allies who are non-nuclear right yeah though that's a that's a terrific question and something i think about a lot these days um so let me just first begin by talking a bit about why the ICBM specifically matters so much for North Korea. Because as you note correctly, um, correctly they've had scuds, uh, they've had um, nodongs, medium range missiles, capable of ranging all of South Korea and Japan. Um, and if they had a sufficiently compact nuclear warhead, uh, those warheads could have been mated with those missiles, uh, effectively bringing the nuclear threat to um, East Asian targets, uh, including uh, in, in Korea and Japan. Uh, and of course, even going back earlier, uh, North Korea has had uh, c conventional artillery units that have held Seoul at risk uh, for years. And um, a, uh, one of the answers to why the Korean War never actually resumed after 1953 in a, in a, uh, a full-scale manner is um, people have attributed that to that conventional deterrence that is obtained, that the cost of a crisis would be high enough for South Korea uh, that the United States and South Korea would be deterred from pushing ahead. But the ICBM, I think, introduces a, a very, um, um, you know, it introduces that decoupling dynamic that you referenced to. And I want to talk a little bit about the precedent of, um, you know, the precedents for decoupling. I mean, uh, decoupling was an issue that in, uh, in the late 1950s, uh, when the Soviets um, brought their first ICBMs online, uh, what became apparent to our Western European allies uh, was that now the United States, while extending deterrence to Europe would have to consider with the fact that the Soviet Union could retaliate from its own homeland with an ICBM against New York City, Washington, D.C. And so the question for many of these countries became, you know, would the United States risk Boston for bomb? Uh, would the United States risk, you know, London for Louisiana, uh, Paris for Portland? Um, and our allies coped with this in different ways, right? I mean, if you look at the reasons why France left NATO's uh, integrated military command and developed an independent nuclear deterrent, a lot of that just had to do with the French not thinking that the United States, you know, that the French not thinking that that was a deal worth taking. Uh, so the concerns now apply in Northeast Asia, uh, because in a conflict, if North Korea uses nuclear weapons or conventional weapons uh, against U.S. military facilities, that would encourage us to retaliate uh, in, uh, in full swing. Uh, but if they held their ICBMs in reserve, the North Koreans would calculate that the United States would think very carefully about making that decision to then retaliate, uh, because if that retaliation were to happen and we failed at preempting or destroying uh, North Korea's ICBMs in, in counterforce strikes, North Korea would then have those resources available to retaliate against the U.S. homeland. Um, and so that's why the ICBMs matter. And if you're South Korea and Japan, you also understand this reasoning. Um, and then the concern for you is, well, if my ally is going to be deterred from coming to my assistance after I suffer a conventional or nuclear attack, then maybe I can't rely on my allies' nuclear weapons anymore, that an extended deterrent is no longer good enough, so maybe I need my own nuclear weapons. Um, of course, this is not anything that we have to worry about right now. I mean, both South Korea and Japan remain committed to their NPT nonproliferation commitments um, and extended deterrence. Uh, you know, our declaratory policy right now is quite clear. It's that if North Korea ever uses nuclear weapons, that is the end of the regime, and we will use any and all means, conventional and nuclear, uh, to, um, to punish North Korea for the use of nuclear weapons. Um, but it is a concern in the, in the long run, because uh, ultimately South Korea and Japan are, are democracies. They need to provide their populations with certain assurances. Um, and of course, I should be clear, too, that the um, public discussion of nuclear weapons is very different in both countries. For reasons I hope that are obvious, uh, Japan's public is a lot less uh, inclined to pursue nuclear weapons uh, than the South Korean public, uh, which, a, um, you know, depending on how you word the polling questions, uh, you can find a, a support anywhere in the high 60s. Uh, to the 40% range. Uh, so this is something that we might have to concern ourselves with in the future if we, um, if the United States fails to um, assure these allies. Uh, you know, extended deterrence is not about altruism. We don't, we don't, we don't extend our nuclear uh, umbrella to Japan and South Korea because we like them or we think that they're nice countries. We do it partly out of non-proliferation considerations, but also partly out of, uh, you know, our own security interests in the, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, but absolutely, I think extended deterrence is going to be uh, something that is going to take a lot more work. Um, and of course, uh, under the Trump administration in particular, uh, you know, we've seen North Korea's capabilities cross some very important qualitative thresholds at the same time that our, ally, uh, our alliances have been under undue stress due to things like extortionate financial demands. Uh, so my hope is that we will focus on the software of, of managing these alliances um, if, uh, if a new administration uh, is, to, uh, is to come into office soon.
Thank you. I was reading this very interesting book, uh, Nuclear Weapons and American Grand Strategy by Francis J. Gavin. And he talked about how the US uh, strategy of inhibition has, you know, focused uh, on friends and foes alike. Obviously, I'm not talking about the geopolitical uh, reasons as to why the US has compromised on its non proliferation policy over um, over, its geop over its geopolitical interest many at many a time. Uh, so I think it's an interesting bit of information that you've given uh, and the analysis is quite instructive. Uh, let's go back to theory. If I were to put it bluntly, I think the DPRK USA nuclear rivalry is one of the manifestations of the continued relevance of the nuclear revolution theory, like the the difference, the conventional difference between the two forces and even the nuclear forces difference between the two forces is way too huge, but the retaliatory capacity and the sheer capacity of the bomb to inflict damage to both uh, the bigger power and the smaller power has kept both countries at bay from hurting each other. So I think that is it. But some of us also talk about the uh, shelling is risk taking or let's say Glenn Snyder's stability and stability paradox theory. So going forward, what do you think, where would this rivalry lie? Would there be room for the stability and stability paradox to creep in? Would it be relevant or would, you, would we be able to see the continued relevance of the, nu of the nuclear revelation theory as was propounded by most clearly by Robert Jervis in his book, uh, you know, which he wrote in 1989? Sure. Um, yeah. So I think I think uh, you know just to just to define things a little. So the stability instability paradox really manifests when you have high levels of strategic stability at the nuclear level. That that uh, that parties A and B, both possessing nuclear weapons, are sufficiently vulnerable uh, to each other's uh, nuclear capabilities. Ergo, having that assurance that a conflict will not escalate to the um, level of unrestricted nuclear warfare both sides are then able to engage in low level limited provocations because they have that assurance that neither will have an incentive to escalate beyond a uh, certain threshold. Um, with North Korea, there is obviously a risk of this. Uh, and uh, we know this because we know that North Korea has a certain appetite for risk. If we look at 2010, uh, one year before uh, Kim Jong-il's death and Kim Jong-un's succession, uh, that was a remarkably dangerous year on the Korean Peninsula. I mean, we talked about how dangerous 2017 was, and I talk about it in the book uh, in terms of nuclear risks. But 2010, I mean, uh, you know, you talk to folks who were in the Korean armed forces, they thought they were going to war after uh, Yongpyongdo, uh, a, an island just uh, south of the northern limit line, the maritime boundary between North and South Korea in, um, in their, um, uh, on the west side of the coast, uh, was shelled by, uh, by North Koreans. And of course, uh, earlier that year, um, the Chonan, a South Korean, Corvette uh, was, suck, um, was uh, sunk by a North Korean uh, torpedo. Um, so the concern has been that if North Korea comes to believe that its nuclear deterrent is so credible and that its ability to hold the U.S. homeland at risk is robust enough that the U.S. takes the hint and accepts that we are in a high level of strategic stability, um, that provocations might, might follow. Uh, along the demilitarized zone, uh, we might even see, uh, you know, kinetic provocations against the South. Um, this hasn't really happened. I mean, the North Koreans have taken certain risks. You know, they blew up the uh, liaison office to make a point about inter-Korean cooperation. Um, and it might not happen. And, and the reason for that, I think, just does go back to uh, the, the, the definition of the stability and stability paradox, which is that it only takes place when there is a very high degree of assurance on both sides that neither party would, would seek to uh, escalate things to, uh, to the nuclear level. And the North Koreans, I don't think, have that today. Um, they, they, might, they might get there in the future, right? I mean, they've been uh, showing off new weapons. We just had a military parade a few days ago, uh, potentially including a uh, MIRV-capable ICBM. Um, so there's, you know, that's an open question, is uh, do the North Koreans get to a certain threshold where they say, uh, you know, we, we have the kinds of capabilities that should indicate to the Americans that uh, they are vulnerable no matter what, uh, despite national missile defenses and uh, conventional preemption capabilities that North Korea feels assured enough in the survivability of its own nuclear force, uh, then I think that risk uh, becomes a little bit more apparent. Uh, but, this is, but this is something that uh, US forces Korea, uh, the South Korean military worry a lot about uh, in terms of conventional deterrence, because um, in, in 2019 and 2020, earlier this year, uh, North Korea 
has been testing a range, um, a suite of uh, highly precise conventional um, ballistic missiles uh, that are more precise than anything they've had before uh, with a range capable of uh, holding most of South Korea at risk. Uh, so these concerns uh, are, are very real today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we uh, have about 10 minutes left and we can squeeze in a couple of questions. Um, so we see, and you have really mentioned it in great details in your book, that a person who was called Rocket Man in 2017, he became my best buddy in 2018. So there's clearly an indication that uh, the Rocket Man got something uh, which made him a best buddy. And there, we, we had this impression that probably we will gonna have a new, we will gonna have a nuclear war with, uh, with, between North Korea and the US, but things turned when, so uh, quote unquote, the deterrent for, was complete. So we also have, we are faced with the problem of the Iranian nuclear program. However, and whatever the stage it, it might be in. Uh, and obviously we see that uh, the US is uh, threatening Iran. It is uh, al also resorting to saber rattling. So what lessons would Iran take? What will be the takeaways for, for Iran B from this North Korean episode and how the perceptions regarding North Korea has changed? There was a time when the US was ready to bomb the hell out of North Korea, but then when it realized that, uh, you know, in retaliation, US cities could be targeted. So, you know, they turned towards diplomacy. And as you said, that Kim only turned towards diplomacy, not because he was brought on the knees, because, because he had a leverage in shape of a complete deterrent. So what would be the lesson for Iran and for other prospective proliferants going forward from this case? Yeah, no, it's it's not a it's not a happy lesson uh, for uh, for other proliferators uh, because I do think if you look at, um, I mean, really, you know, I, uh, you said it. I mean, North Korea developed nuclear weapons and we treated them like a nuclear power. Uh, you know, we had a leader level summit, the first ever between a sitting U.S. president and a North Korean leader, and we uh, we had a very frank, respectful exchange. Uh, the you know, I mean, leaving aside the personal relationship between President Trump and Kim Jong Un. Uh, and in the meantime, I mean, you know, the Trump administration was ripping the JCPOA apart and uh, basically showing the Iranians that the value of good faith diplomacy with the United States uh, is, is, really, um, is really quite low. And, you know, the North Koreans could also have told the Iranians that based on their own experiences with the agreed framework, uh, right? So this was the 1994 agreement that froze North Korea's uh, plutonium past the bomb uh, and all after the Bush administration uh, alleged that North Korea was setting up a uh, clandestine uranium enrichment program. Um, and the North Koreans really thought the United States didn't operate in good faith in that, in that Clinton to Bush transition. And they, of course, saw that again with Iran from the Obama to Trump transition in terms of the JCPOA. Uh, so the lessons for proliferation here, I think, are, are, are not happy at all. Uh, Iranians have also made this point that, you know, look at the North Koreans. You've also had, I think, you know, Mike Pompeo, I think, has uh, has just said it out loud. The reason we treated North Korea differently is because they have nuclear weapons, right? Which is a terrible thing to say if you're trying to prevent proliferation. Um, so I think uh, I think the lesson the Iranians take away, and if the Iranians do decide that, um, you know, they've had enough and they can't be um, they can't come back to the negotiating table, even even with the Democratic administration in the future, um, in North Korea, I think we'll have some lessons there. Of course, the North Koreans keep talking about how they don't want to turn up like Libya or Iraq. Uh, this is a constant theme in their, uh, in their state media discussions of nuclear weapons. And part of the reason why uh, Kim Kei-gwan, a, uh, um, a senior North Korean official uh, at the foreign ministry, uh, previously the first vice minister, um, was so incensed when John Bolton uh, suggested that the uh, Libya model could be an appropriate solution for North Korea. Uh, so I think the, the lessons for proliferation from the three years of the Trump administration's policy uh, taken together, you know, you take the Iran policy and the North Korea policy in tandem, um, you don't see a United States that's committed to non-proliferation as, as, a, as a first order value in, in foreign affairs. Um, and I think ultimately to some countries that will show them that nuclear weapons do still have value. Okay, so my absolute last question from you again, uh, related to something theoretical. Um, I firmly believe that the greater the ability to deter, the lesser the ability of your adversary to compel. 
I think this is a very plain and simple equation. Uh, given that we have this example in front of us, uh, whereby a small nuclear power has effectively deterred uh, a greater nuclear power from, you know, uh, doing something that that the smaller nuclear power did, did not does not want to do or did not want to do. Uh, what is the future of great power compellents in a nuclear environment and even in a non-nuclear environment? And for instance, if if a great power wants to compel a small power, again it would again we would again try to revert back to the proliferation lessons that this could have. So a quality deterrent, a credible deterrent could effectively dissuade a potential compellent threat from coming your way. So what is the future of the use of force as a tool for great, great powers in global politics? Because this again lies at the heart of the nuclear revelation theory, which says that the nuclear weapons have, you know, really stifled and attenuated the ability of great powers to use force in a very nonchalant and a very unremitting manner. So this is my last question. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's something that I, I think I'd have to uh, take some time to think about to give a deep answer on. Uh, but, you know, I mean, generally speaking, the value of nuclear weapons uh, in, uh, in coercion to pursue um, revisionist objectives, be they territorial uh, or what have you, is generally quite lousy. I think the historical, uh, the historic record shows. Um, nuclear weapons are good at deterring uh, existential threats. Um, they're good at deterring, um, um, you know, broader, um, broader military assaults against one's territory, um, but they don't necessarily coerce in the way that um, early, early proponents of nuclear coercion. I mean, in the 1950s, you look at the United States and Eisenhower um, in, uh, in East Asia, um, want it, right? So a nuclear coercion isn't going to be turned on its head anytime soon. I think the North Korean case um, does, however, indicate that, you know, you, uh, you referenced uh, a smaller nuclear power and a greater nuclear power, but of course the nuclear revolution works because uh, you don't really have small nuclear weapons. All nuclear weapons do have that ability to produce dramatic strategic effects, uh, be they North Korean or American. And while there are differences in consideration based on uh, force sizes and, and things like that, the North Koreans can still get away with, uh, with a fair bit. Uh, what was interesting, though, it was in August 2018 when the North Koreans tried to uh, imply that they would um, you know, they wanted to compel the United States to stop bomber flights by threatening to bracket Guam with Hwasong-12 intermediate range ballistic missiles. Uh, so that to me was a really interesting example uh, of the North Koreans um, trying out their hand a little bit at, at nuclear compellents. Uh, it didn't really work, um, but, but it is interesting to see that the North Koreans are, are exploring right now as a, uh, as a new nuclear state, having, uh, having crossed those important thresholds in 2017. I think they're increasingly exploring what their nuclear status and what their possession of nuclear weapons can do for them. So I think that's, um, that's an important uh, takeaway from this too. Thank you very much. We could have had this discussion uh, proceed for, for a very, very, very long time because we had many questions that, uh, that could have been asked uh, about nuclear strategy, about whether the strategy would change in the, in the future or would remain static. You said uh, the North Koreans would obviously go first and go big. And this is actually quite, quite rational. Uh, but in the interest of time, we have to end this program. I really thank you for joining me in this series. And it was a very interesting conversation. And I think um, there's a, there are a lot of lessons for us to learn um, in reading your book and also uh, engaging with your works that you you know do uh, at various platforms i again thank you uh, for joining me and i look forward to engaging with you further thank you very much thank you very much thanks for the great questions and for reading the book appreciate it